Welcome to our virtual question and answer live stream COVID-19 update for New Jersey parents and caregivers of school-aged children presented by the New Jersey Department of Health. I'm Dr. Meg Fisher. I'm the Acting uh, Deputy Commissioner of Public Health Services. And I have three wonderful colleagues with me here tonight who are pediatricians and one is a school nurse. Our first pediatrician, Dr. Kristen Pine, works as a general pediatrician at Monmouth Medical Center in Long Branch, uh, New Jersey. Dr. Sanjana Shah is also a uh, general pediatrician and a hospitalist, and she's been uh, active at several hospitals, including Monmouth Medical Center, but also at Capital Health Medical Center. And our school nurse is Jamie Weller, who's now the deputy. Uh, she is a, actually an, a New Jersey certified school health nurse, but she's also the deputy director of the New Jersey Department of Health's Office of Local Public Health. We are very excited to be here and we're excited to uh, start by answering all of your questions and we're taking lots of questions, put them in the chat, let us know, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be handling uh, your questions. To get us started, we have a few questions that have come in. The first one is, how do I know if my child is eligible for a COVID-19 uh, bivalent vaccine. Dr. Schaller, Dr. Pine. Yeah, so um, this one's pretty easy for us to answer. So now all kids over six months of age are eligible for the bivalent vaccine. So most likely if your child is over six months of age, they are eligible. <laughs> so uh, would an exception be if they had already received it? Yes, yeah, and it, that's true. And the exception would be if they haven't yet received, or if, if they already have received a bivalent vaccine. But if they've received the monovalent, the original COVID vaccine, um, if they've received boosters of that, then they are eligible for, for a bivalent. And so exception to that would be if the child is immunocompromised, then they may be eligible for a second bivalent vaccine in which case you should speak with your child's pediatrician or specialist to get information specifically with regards to your child. Perfect. And you know, all of this information was just updated a week ago. So you are getting the most up-to-date information. This is uh, new recommendations as of a week ago that a uh, bivalent uh, vaccine is, is what everybody needs and the schedules do vary. And uh, you've now uh, heard what they are. So what's the difference between the COVID-19 boosters that we had last year and this new bivalent uh, vaccine that actually came around in September of uh, 2022. So the bivalent vaccine was designed to also cover for variants that we've now discovered, such as the Omicron variant. And there's preliminary data showing that even the most recent circulating variants are being um, neutralized by the bivalent vaccine. And so the original type of COVID vaccine that children were receiving, the monovalent vaccine, is no longer going to be available, and all vaccines will now be bivalent vaccines. And it sounds like that means my child would be better protected for what's out there right now. That's correct. Great. So do I need the first uh, COVID vaccine before I get this current bivalent one? I think you actually just answered that. In fact, those monovalent ones are no longer uh, available. The, the, um, their authorization for use uh, has been withdrawn and we now have it a little bit easier because we just have the uh, bivalent uh, vaccine. So, so um, if you call your, your, uh, your pediatrician or your healthcare provider to schedule the appointment, do you have to specify which vaccine you want? So, I mean, all children who are who are eligible for a bivalent vaccine, um, that that is the only vaccine that they will be receiving at this point. So it it'd be the bivalent, either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so their schedules really dependent on which of those two they they will receive um, in the in your child's age. Um, but if you have any specific questions about the schedules, we can definitely answer those as well. And uh, Jamie, we know that that some providers have uh, both vaccines, some only have one, some have the other. Um, if you go to a pharmacy, how do you know which one, which vaccines they're gonna stock? So our vaccine finders can help provide some of that information. 
Um, you know, also, if you are uh, going to a site such as like a local health department, um, you could always give a call ahead to that local health department to see the type of vaccine that is being offered um, if there if there would be a preference on behalf of parents. And, and what do you think? Should we have a preference? Is one vaccine better than the other? Which one should we be getting? I mean, I think in terms of effectiveness and side effects, they're they're pretty equivalent. Um, really, it's just the schedules that would be different. So if you have a preference in terms of the, you know, the number of vaccines that you would be receiving right now for kids under the age of five receiving the Pfizer vaccine, it is a three dose series of the bivalent vaccine. Again, that depends on what they've received, what your child has received in the past. If they have gotten the original COVID vaccine and were, you know, fully vaccinated up to this point, they would only need one dose of the bivalent. But if they were previously unvaccinated under the age of five with Pfizer, they would need three. Um, and with Moderna, they would um, need two, two vaccines if they hadn't previously been vaccinated. And again, if they were already vaccinated with one or two Moderna vaccines, they would only need one of the bivalent Moderna vaccines. And the was- vaccine schedule is a little bit confusing, Dr. Mm-hmm. Fisher, because Pfizer and Moderna actually have different age cutoffs. So if your child is six or older, it's very easy. They really just need one bivalent uh, vaccine to be considered fully immunized against COVID-19. If your child is five, that's where there may be a difference between Moderna and Pfizer. And so if it's confusing to you, like it is to most of us, I encourage you to reach out to your local health department or your pediatrician because they have access to the most recent and most up-to-date information and can help guide you as your child um, is going through that four, five, six year age uh, period. Yes, and that's a good point. So it's a lot more simple for kids over the age of six. They even if you haven't been, even if they haven't been previously vaccinated. So if your child hasn't received any COVID nineteen vaccines, they only need one dose of the bivalent vaccine to be fully vaccinated. So one of our viewers is asking, um, why are we advising all children over six months to get vaccinated? when most children are not even affected by COVID. So what do you say to that one? I think that's a very a very good question in the sense that we're trying to decide as parents, what's the risk of something versus what's the benefit of something? And through the years that we've had the COVID vaccine and now with the bivalent vaccine, we do know that the vaccine does protect against serious illness, hospitalizations and unfortunate fatal um, forms of the disease as well. So it really is the best way that you can protect your child and know that you've done everything you can to protect your child against COVID-19. And And also, you know, preventing children from getting, it it does prevent children from acquiring the illness altogether and spreading to, you know, higher risk family members and higher risk members of of the community, as well as other higher risk children that they may come to contact with either, you know, within their household or at school and other locations. And I know both of you uh, work in hospitals. Are children getting hospitalized with COVID-19? We are not seeing children being hospitalized now to the same degree that we had seen in the past. Um, And we're very thankful for that because we don't want children to be admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 related illness. And a large part of that is thanks to the public health efforts that everyone has undertaken allowed the vaccine to become available so that we can protect our population. And uh, do we think there will be more and different variants in the future? Yeah, I mean, we we expect, obviously, the virus will continue to circulate. And if it circulates, it will continue to mutate. So we do expect to see different variants. Um, You know, as as has been reported in the media, there are there is a new variant causing you know slightly different symptoms right now. Um, seeing a little bit more predominance of conjunctivitis with the with the new variant that's been circulating. So that's an example of how you know we see the virus mutate and change over time. Uh, Follow up question: um, What type of studies have been done to prove the vaccine is safe for children? So I mean, Dr. I think Fisher, a lot of the vaccines. Oh, yeah. you go? I was going to say, I would, I would love to hear um, your expertise on this. Oh sure. So before mm-hmm. a vaccine can even get to the fa- to the point where it's uh, authorized for use, lots and lots of safety studies have to occur. So as a vaccine is being developed, 
is first developed in often in animal models and then in small numbers of adults, then larger numbers of adults, and then larger number of children. And we know with the COVID vaccines, they have been given to literally billions of adults globally. And we have safety monitors, monitoring systems that have continued since that very first dose of vaccine was given in the US in December of 2020, the very first um, authorized dose. Before that, doses were given to uh, ensure that we knew what was the right dose and is the vaccine safe. So we, we have very, very robust safety data and it's ongoing. So we don't just have a vaccine that comes into use and we stop looking for problems. We continue to monitor that. We continue to see, is the vaccine as effective? And one of the reasons that the monovalent vaccines are no longer authorized is because we have a better choice. The bivalent vaccine is designed for what's circulating at the moment. So as those things happen, it's both safety and efficacy are constantly monitored. Um, and I think as with all vaccines, safety is absolutely critical because we're giving this to our children and we have to ensure that what we're giving them is safe. And it's true that they did trials specifically on children as well. It's not that they were just using the adult data, right? That's absolutely true. Before, it, one of the reasons the vaccine was first uh, given to adults was because they didn't have the information in children. So it was first rolled out for adults. And then, you know, we, we, we really wanted children to be protected as well. And it was only after there was enough information on safety in children that it became authorized for use in children. Okay, let's get to another question. Um, this is about uh, summer, summer camp, summer day camp. Are there any additional risks of children getting infected with um, COVID-19 this summer at day camp? And what else can we do to protect them other than vaccines? Yeah, so I mean, I think we often do see a surge of COVID, you know, late summertime, early fall. So it is possible that, you know, summer camp, we could see, you know, an increase in infection during the summer just because of, you know, the seasonality that we've been seeing. Um, I think, you know, obviously vac vaccination um, is important for protecting your children who are going to summer camp, having, you know, the updated bivalent vaccine. Um, in addition to that, there are other, you know, public health safety measures that are done in indoor environments, particularly in schools that I think, you know, our, our school nurse, Jamie Weller, can talk a little bit more about. Um, and sure. yeah. Sorry, sure, sure, Dr. Pine, thanks. Um, so that's a great point. Um, ensuring your child is up to date with the bivalent vaccine is always critical. Um, and then when anytime, as Dr. Pine mentioned, where we have people congregating, um, you're at, you definitely have a risk of transmission. Um, so the, the typical hygiene practices of washing hands, staying home when you're sick, if you feel as though your child may have been exposed to COVID-19 or is exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19, making sure that you're getting your child tested. Um, and thankfully, we've come a long way with testing where testing is much more readily available and accessible um, for you to be able to make sure that your child is not, again, infected or then further spreading COVID-19. So there are some more public health examples of ways to keep your child safe at camp. Um, and also on our website, if you go through COVID19.nj.gov, you can find links to our department's website where there are additional materials specific to youth camps and schools. Although I just want to add that as pediatricians and moms, I know that we are both extremely thrilled that summer camps are open and happening for our children. And we're happy that parents can have their kids enjoy the sunshine this summer. Yes, I would say definitely the benefits of going to camp over the summer far outweigh the risks. So I wouldn't hold your child out of camp for any of these risks. <laughs> great, great, great points. And and I did uh, notice that the camp advice was just updated. And so there is uh, new information on that COVID-19 uh, uh, website. Um, we have a question from uh, Lisa. Lisa's asking, will the COVID-19 vaccine be made mandatory like other vaccines are in order to, to attend public school? I have not seen anything at this time that is suggesting that the COVID vaccine will become mandatory. 
Um, this, this is an important time, though, to just remind families and remind folks that there are mandatory vaccines for school. And if you found that you've missed a few appointments or that your child's gotten behind on routine vaccinations, those are extremely important to keep up with because we are seeing prevented uh, vaccine preventable illness starting to surge back in the United States, specifically because during the pandemic, it was difficult to make sure that your children stayed up to date with their routine vaccinations. So I do highly encourage parents to make appointments with their pediatricians and make sure their kids are caught up on their routine vaccines. Yeah, great point. <laughs> the other thing about camp is that you have children from lots of different areas who are now coming together. So they bring whatever is circulating in their community right into camp where they are happy to share it with others. They don't necessarily share their gloves or balls or bats, but they're happy to share their germs. So uh, so it's a, it's a good time to remember those simple things like hand washing, et cetera. But uh, remembering uh, camp when I was a kid, I fully agree that the benefits uh, way outweigh uh, the risks for almost all of our children. Um, let's see. Uh, Regina has a question. What are the COVID rates now? Are they on the decline or are they increasing? So Dr. Fisher, from the public health perspective, um, our COVID rates in general are much lower than we have seen, um, even when you compare to the past couple of years at this time. Um, so overall, our transmission um, has been lower, but we always do have to consider that with the emergence of home testing, there are probably a lot of people that may be sick that are not coming in our system with our rates to know that they're actually infected with COVID-19. Um, but overall, our, our numbers are um, pretty low for this time of year, um, which is certainly positive. Um, and again, um, in, reinforcing the importance of that bivalent vaccine um, and all those other public health measures uh, were, are going to help us um, stay low, uh, particularly as we head into the summer months, hopefully. Yeah, I think you make a great point of the fact that we know that we're underestimating the, um, the prevalence of disease, uh, not only because people with home tests are not necessarily reporting it, but people with mild illness may not even be tested at all. So, so we, we do tend to, in general, for most illnesses, we underestimate how much is out there uh, just because not everybody's getting tested. Yeah, I'd say particularly like less testing is probably going on in the pediatric population just because it used to be mandatory to return to school to have a PCR test result. So all of those cases were officially documented, whereas now, you know, those man those you know requirements for school have have been removed. So we're probably not we're definitely not testing as much as we were in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. Great point. Uh, from our, our modeling, we, we also predicted that we would see a, a gradual decrease in the incidence of hospitalizations, and that is happening as well. Um, and, and I think this is, this is really very good news. Um, we're not sure what's going to happen in the fall, whether we will get a new variant or whether they're, you know, after as, as people regather uh, in September, will there be a risk? Um, but we, we certainly will continue to monitor that. We have a question from Alicia. Are there reports of any serious side effects on record with children? In terms of the vaccine or yeah. in COVID? Um, we'll do the vaccine first, and then we, we might go to COVID as well. <laughs> um, I mean, so in terms of vaccine, it's with the bivalent vaccine, the side effects are similar to those with the monovalent vaccine. Like most common side effects that we see are mild side effects. Um, so, you know, so, so pain at the injection site, myalgia, sometimes fever um, and, and fatigue. We are, we, we do still see, you know, a couple cases of myocarditis, particularly in that like males who are adolescents and young adults. However, again, this is very rare and there's no evidence that the rate of this is increased with the bivalent, bivalent vaccine versus the monovalent vaccine. And it is much higher risk to have, you know, an, a COVID infection and have cardiac illness um, in this age group than it is from having a vaccine. So we do still highly recommend the vaccine, you know, even despite these very rare side effects. And if you have any hesitations, concerns, or questions about your child's particular risk of a serious adverse event like myocarditis or pericarditis, please ask your pediatrician because they know you, they know your child, and they're gonna be able to guide you in terms of what the best recommendation is for your child. Great points. 
And of course, with any medicine, there is the risk for an allergic reaction, but those again, tend to be extremely uh, rare. So thanks. Uh, from Claudette, what is the best, most accurate way to monitor COVID cases? And will mask mandates change in medical facilities, et cetera, if cases rise again? So Jamie, do you wanna talk about monitoring cases from public health standpoint? Sure, so we look at a, a lot of different metrics. Um, we do look at our case counts. Uh, we also look at this time, we can still track how many of the cases that are being reported into our system are coming back positive. So that's a metric that we call percent positivity to help us gauge um, some of the transmission that might be going on and how many people who are being tested for COVID are actually positive. Uh, we also look, as Dr. Fisher mentioned, um, and our pediatricians can attest to at the hospitalizations, uh, for COVID-19. We also trend other data, um, looking at the age distribution, um, gender, things of that nature, race, ethnicity, so that we can really keep a close eye on where we might be seeing different um, cases emerge in different populations so that we can always remain abreast to what's going on with those COVID cases. Um, and then regarding the masking, as of now, um, the New, New Jersey does follow the CDC risk-based approach. And what that means is that they would recommend source control. And source control is basically wearing a mask when you think you might be exposed to something or there's a risk of being exposed. So we do recommend source control or face covering in healthcare facilities if we are in high level of community transmission in that county. So um, that is why you may see some recommendations shifting based on what is going on in with the transmission in that area. And the good news is, as of last week and this week, um, all of the counties in New Jersey uh, for the healthcare uh, communities are at a risk where uh, mandatory masking is no longer um, absolute. So, so we're we're definitely seeing a decrease in the transmission rates. And if we look at community transmission rates, the they're down across the state. So all of the counties in the state are now in in the green mode which uh, green is good in this case. Um, another, another one from uh, um, uh, Claudette. How accurate are the at-home tests with the new variant? Sure, I can take this one, Dr. Fisher. Um, as, of, as of now, um, we have no evidence that uh, the home tests, primarily the antigen tests that are done in the home setting, um, are not going to pick up any new variants. Um, we always are maintaining communication um, with the federal government on those types of matters. Um, and we'll certainly, if something were to emerge as being um, not identified on those home tests, there would be a lot of communication on that. Um, so specifically to that new variant, I, I can't speak to that, um, you know, at that at this moment, but as of now with other variants that we've experienced, there's no evidence to say that th they would not be identified on home tests. It's still picking up the antigen um, of, the, of the virus. And at least at uh, screening of the state, we are able to detect that new virus. We know that it is, it is up to about uh, 12 to 16 percent now of our isolates are the the um, uh, I can never get them the, the uh, letters and numbers right. Uh, so we'll go to the uh, arc arcanate. Um, yeah, the like the XBB 1.6. <laughs> there yeah. you go. There it is. <laughs> 1.16. <laughs> That's exactly it. Thank you so much for the reminder. Uh, and yes, so so I think uh, we feel pretty comfortable. And as as uh, as uh, Jamie well mentioned, we are monitoring this and we'll continue to to monitor. Uh, question from Meds: What are the risks of vaccine in children and young adults? And then um, the comment is: Some sports forms in school now require uh, uh, cardio, is myocarditis on the rise in children? Thanks. Anyone want to take this? So it, I, yeah. I can take it from the perspective of um, kind of reiterating what Dr. Pine had said about the myocarditis risks. So the reason that that showed up on the school forms was not because of the vaccine, but was more to identify children who are at risk for COVID-related complications 
COVID related cardiac or heart complications and children who may be experiencing symptoms of long COVID. And so while we know that there is a risk in the uh, specifically the adolescent male population of having myocarditis or pericarditis, we are talking um, a minuscule risk. Um, I think the latest data I saw was something to the effect of 70 cases out of a million uh, vaccine doses. Um, and so that is actually lower than the risk of myocarditis or pericarditis after having natural COVID-19 disease. Um, and so the reason that that question made it onto the school form was really, is your child at risk for a heart problem because they had a uh, symptomatic COVID-19 illness? Um, and so it's really a flag for your pediatrician who's clearing the child to participate in sports to make sure they've thought about is the child at risk and do they need any specific clearance before they can play or participate in sports in school. Thank you. That, that I think that explains it. Uh, that explains it perfectly. It's also important to remember that the myocarditis that is reported after the vaccine is a very transient uh, problem with mainly uh, having some chest pain that lasts for um, 10, 12 hours, uh, generally not much longer than that. And there does not appear to be any long-term effects of that. On the other hand, if you have heart involvement with the disease myocarditis, there can be um, ongoing problems with, with uh, coronary arteries in a few reported cases. And it also does take much longer for the heart to come back to normal. So, so uh, no question. Uh, in this case, the uh, vaccine is much, much safer than uh, than the disease. Uh, let me go to the next one here from uh, Lisa. If a child is COVID positive and returns to school on day six, are they still required to wear a mask from day six to ten in school? So, yeah. I, I think, um, Dr. Fisher, this is. The recommendation would be that yes, um, the student coming back from isolation um, would still be recommended to wear a mask. Although there are school level policies um, in place where different schools may have different requirements or recommendations. Um, but generally the public health guidance would be um, on from day six through the end of the full isolation period, the student would be recommended uh, to mask. And if there are any specific questions, I just wanna say you could always reach out to your local health department. They are a great resource in all of your communities that can definitely help to provide additional guidance, perhaps based on your specific situation as well. Thanks, and the, re the reason for that mask is, although we know most people would not be transmitting virus from day six on, there are some children who would still be shedding virus and you can decrease the risk that they will uh, share that virus by simply having them uh, wear the face cover. So yes, they, they should be um, wearing the mask from uh, day six to 10, thanks. Yeah, I think it's important too that you know, their symptoms are also improving and that they're fever free for at least 24 hours before they return to school after a COVID infection. Right, and for the immunocompromised child, then they should talk to their healthcare provider to see when it really is uh, safe for them to return. Uh, from Kendra, my three and four year old got their initial vaccine in September. When should they get the new bivalent or should I wait for the fall to give it to them? So they would be eligible for, you know, the, the, the bivalent currently because it would have been the, the monovalent, I believe that they received in September since the, the bivalent was, I think, available around that time, but not for kids. So. Um, so they would be avail they would be eligible currently for the bivalent, and we do recommend that they they get it and not wait till the fall. And remember, for children, those those multiple doses do build up their immunity. So just like with influenza vaccine, when when uh, when we get our flu shots, we only need one shot. But children under eight need two shots the first season because you're building up that immunity. They don't have the memory that um, the rest of us have from having lived and, and uh, picked up this, that, and the other thing. In terms of timing of the bivalent vaccine, you can get it as soon as two months after you have completed the initial series of the monovalent. So your children would be eligible. The ideal timing is recommended four to six months after the primary series. 
Um, now, remember, for children six and up, even if they've never had a vaccine in the past, all they need is that one bivalent vaccine to be considered fully up to date. So if it's a question of, you know, should I wait to the fall when they're getting their flu vaccine and kind of get them both done at the same time? I think that is something we may be looking at in the future. Um, but for now, to have your children protected as soon as possible, especially for summer and summer activities, you know, that I, I don't see a reason to wait for the fall. For those kids that may have recently started the vaccine series, so if, you know, within the past couple of weeks they received a monovalent vaccine, there would be no change to the schedule. It would just be that they would receive the bivalent instead of the monovalent. So, you know, with Pfizer, the second dose is supposed to be up about three to eight weeks after the first dose. So you would still follow that schedule. It would just be, you know, a different vaccine that you would re you would receive. It would replace those, you know, second two doses of, of the monovalent original COVID vaccine. Thanks. Uh, from Tanya, should immunocompromised individuals get a second and third booster? So specifically for children, um, right now, if you're over the age of six, they, you are eligible for a second uh, bivalent vaccine. Um, however, if you're under the age of six, so five and under, there is no data that says that a second bivalent vaccine is going to better protect your child. So under the age of six, there's no data to suggest they need a booster. Over the age of six, you would talk to your, I would recommend you talk to your pediatrician about your child, your child's particular case. Um, and if they do, if they would benefit from a, a bivalent vaccine, a second dose. And for adults who are immunocompromised, no question, the adults should get the um, additional booster. And it, now adults who are immunocompromised are eligible for a, a second bivalent booster two months after their last dose, at least if it's at least two months after their last dose. And then for severely immunocompromised um, adults, they should talk to their, to their physicians and see whether um, they would need more than just that one extra dose. So they can actually get doses every two months. Now that would be really on the advice of, of your doctor. So if you're very immunocompromised, uh, talk to your doctor and see what the, the recommendation is. In general, it's always a good idea to talk to your healthcare provider and, and really get their information. As, as uh, I think Dr. Shaw said earlier, they know you best, they know your family, they know your circumstances. That's the benefit of having a medical home is that they, they really can give you the best advice. And I know, Dr. Fisher, sometimes we're talking about boosters, sometimes we're talking about bivalent vaccines, and it can get confusing. Um, so just to clarify, booster is the bivalent vaccine. There's no separate vaccine that you are receiving or that your child would be receiving as a, quote, booster. It is just another dose of the bivalent vaccine. Good point. The, the terminology has gotten over the, over the time course has changed and it does uh, sometimes get confusing. Uh, here's from Kitty. Um, there was mention of what is being tracked, but I would be interested in where we can also find this information and stay informed as well. What is recommended as a source for information? Sure. Uh, so the website that we shared earlier, the covid19.nj.gov, um, if you scroll all the way to the bottom of that website, there's a very extensive data dashboard um, that we share that has all different information um, regarding vaccination coverage, case summaries, things of that nature. Um, there's a lot of data on there that you can certainly take a look at that will help you trend where the virus is um, and how things are trending, as well as vaccination coverage for your community. And the, the New Jersey Department of Health well, website in general has lots of information on communicable diseases, not just COVID-19, but uh, right now there's a salmonella outbreak. So you can find that information on the New Jersey Department of Health uh, Communicable Diseases website. Um, they will have all that information. Of course, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has very good accurate information. And uh, I do have to put a, a, a plug in for a non-government source, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, has a website for parents called healthychildren.org. And it not only tells them about COVID-19 vaccine, but it gives very up-to-date and accurate information about a whole variety of uh, not only infections in children, but behavioral conditions in children, mental health things. 
anything that you might want to know about your child. Um, it's, and, and the website is also available in Spanish as well as, as English. So those are, are some sources. We very much want to send you to the New Jersey Department of Health uh, resources, but we realize that there, there are times uh, when there are other resources out there as well. Um, from Claudia, what is the level of protection that the newer vaccines give to people exposed to the virus? So I think the most important thing about the new vaccines is that they are just better for covering the, the current circulating strains. Um, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but they there is a reduced risk of developing symptomatic COVID infection um, if you've received the bivalent disease compared to if you or if you've received the bivalent vaccine compared to if you haven't received the vaccine. Um, do you know the exact risk reduction, Dr. Fisher? We don't have a risk reduction, but um, we know that the vaccine efficacy um, so from starting from a few weeks after you get the vaccine, it starts out pretty high at 80 percent vaccine efficacy, uh, meaning that most people are protected. And then it does over time, it does drop down, which is the reason we have to talk about boosters in the first place. And this is true of uh, vaccines for most respiratory pathogens. It's not, unfortunately, we haven't yet devised the vaccine that'll protect you for life. Um, I guess the exception is measles, but that's a, a little bit different uh, respiratory spread. Actually, it is respiratory spread, but it's a live vaccine, so that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, we, we there are very nice studies that have looked at uh, disease in, in this country. And we also have statistics right here in New Jersey that shows that the additional booster does give benefit as far as protecting against hospitalization and against severe illness. So I, I can't give you the, the actual numbers. And remember, it, you only get these vaccine efficacies over time. So it does take a little, a little while and it does vary by, uh, by the strain, by the variant strain. We, we suspect that it, it does vary. And it also varies from time since you've been vaccinated and also whether you have uh, added immunity from natural disease. And um, there is preliminary data specifically about the new variant that we were trying to remember the acronyms for, the XBB, XBB 1.5. Um, and there is data that the bivalent vaccine does seem to decrease the risk of having symptomatic disease from even this variant, at least for the first three months after you receive the bivalent vaccine. Thanks. So here's a question from Carolyn. I have a one-year-old who is not yet vaccinated. Is the vaccine still two doses, three weeks apart for Pfizer, or is it only one dose of the newer Pfizer vaccine? Yeah, so it's a little confusing, but depending on if, if he's had Pfizer, then it's going to be still three doses, depending on what your child has already had. If, yeah, well, oh yeah, I guess in your case, your child hasn't been vaccinated yet. So if they've been, if they've been previously unvaccinated, they're going to need three doses of the bivalent vaccine. So I believe it's the, the first two doses are about three to eight weeks apart, and then they'll require a third dose as well, um, at least eight weeks after the second dose for the third dose. Um, and you could talk to your pediatrician about potentially a Moderna vaccine for your child, because that is only two doses. Yeah, and the Moderna would be the two doses with the second dose four to eight weeks after the first dose. <laughs> and all of those doses now are the bivalent vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I did just uh, take a second there to look up the the uh, the XBB point one point one six and the, its other name is Arcturus, uh, just because I don't know why, but <laughs> a, uh, kind of a cute name. Uh, okay, I don't see any. We do have uh, still a few more questions. We don't have any new ones in the chat, but we'll keep our eye on that. Um, is there such a thing? As uh, we've sort of already answered that. Here's a question. Will the bivalent uh, vaccine continue to be available to my family at no cost with insurance or NJ state programs? Yeah, so most likely, you know, your vac the vaccine will be available to you. It all depends, again, on your, you know, exact personal circumstances. Um, but, you know, Medicare and Medicaid will likely cover the vaccine with no additional cost. Um, and most commercial private insurances also will, you know, even after the emergency 
um, the state of emergency for COVID has has expired. Um, and then for uninsured patients, there are other vaccine programs that are available, you know, particularly for kids, the um, vaccine for children program um, is available and, and kids will be able to receive the COVID vaccine at no additional cost through the, the VFC program, which is, you know, the, vac the vaccine for kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the federal government has actually purchased a, a very large stockpile of bivalent vaccine, and they have uh, promised that that will remain available. Uh, well after the May 11, when the public health emergency ends. So, so those vaccines that are already authorized uh, will be available free of charge. The question comes in and, and what Dr. Pine answered was, what about when the vaccine becomes so-called commercialized? So the next vaccine, the next booster that we can expect probably in the fall, will that still be covered? Will it still be free? And that's where that's where we're we're very reassured that um, because the the recommendation for children to be immunized is part of uh, the vaccines for children recommendations, um, those vaccines will be offered for underinsured and uninsured. And the Affordable Care Act uh, guarantees you that that your insurance company will cover you for preventive care for for people who have their own insurance. So, so good news on that front. Uh, uh, Jamie, tell us about what are some of the things that New, the New Jersey Department of Health is doing to protect children in schools? Sure, so as I've shared previously um, uh, on, you know, a few minutes ago, uh, our website has a lot of information about how to protect kids in school. And we work very closely with all of our local health departments here in the state of which we have over 100. Um, that are really tasked as leaders in the community for public health to help hit uh, all residents, but particularly kids in schools in this lens, um, safe within the schools. Uh, so there's always guidance that you can reach out and discuss with your local health department if you have questions. Uh, your school nurses are a huge resource within your community that know your community really well and can always keep parents in, in the loop about things that might be going on particular to that school. Um, but another program that the department has recently announced is a program to offer free HEPA purifiers and filters to New Jersey schools at no cost to the school. And what a HEPA purifier is, it's a freestanding device that's portable that could sit in the classroom. Uh, we're told they're extremely quiet um, and they go throughout the day and do some air exchanges and filter out environmental allergens and air, uh, airborne irritants and infectious disease uh, airborne particles. So in this case, it's very helpful for something like COVID-19 and the way that that is transmitted. Um, it can pick up some of those particles, particles of other infectious diseases and germs, as Dr. Fisher mentioned, that might be um, moving around in school. And also for things such as pollen or dust or mold uh, that may be prevalent in your child's school. So this is a free program that the schools are able to opt into. Uh, we also would imagine that if we're reducing the airborne irritants and infectious disease, it could also help with things such as asthma, depending upon your child's triggers for asthma. Uh, so the schools can opt in via a survey uh, that the Department of Health has opened, and we are still accepting schools to this program. So if you are interested um, and want to know if your school is participating, you could always reach out to the school's leadership, the school's school nurse. Um, and ask questions about the program, and we would be happy to take them into the program and support your community with these free purifiers uh, just to help improve indoor air quality for all of our students here in New Jersey. Thank you. And that, I think, is great news for, for our children. We have a couple more new questions now have come in from uh, Doalbi. Uh, what's your response to the recent WHO announcement that one in 10 infections end up with long COVID. At this rate, would it imply that everyone will eventually get long COVID? So what do we know about long COVID? So um, it is not as common in children as it is in adults. However, we are seeing reports of long COVID symptoms in children. And we know that long COVID does not mean that your body is still fighting against COVID, COVID disease. It's not that there are COVID, you know, little particles floating around in the body that the body is constantly triggered and trying to fight. It's that your body is now trying to recover from having to mount such a big immune response to fighting a virus like COVID-19. And some of the symptoms that you might find are fatigue, um, 
palpitations, headaches, uh, brain fog, or difficulty concentrating. And these are serious. So it's definitely going to be something that our, um, our healthcare community is going to have to monitor over time. You know, statistics are tricky because although we all will probably come into contact with COVID-19 at some point, um, if 10 to 20 percent of us end up having long COVID symptoms, that does not imply that all of us over time will have COVID-19 um, or long COVID or COVID-19 related complications. So statistics are a little bit tricky in that way, where it can be really hard to interpret what they mean to us on the individual level. Um, there are centers that have uh, opened, including in our state, really focusing on children who may be exhibiting signs of long COVID. So if you're concerned that your child may be having signs of long COVID, you should talk to your pediatrician about if they need to be referred to one of these centers to really monitor them more closely. Great points. And uh, for the adults, we it, it is a little higher incidence. Um, depending on which study you read, it can be anywhere from 10 to 15 percent. Uh, probably that that World Health Organization uh, statistic of one in 10 is is probably accurate. We do know that long COVID is uh, more common in people who have had more severe disease. And we also know that long COVID is less common in people who have been immunized. So yet another reason to immunize your children. Um, I think those symptoms of long COVID really can be debilitating. And the idea that you have trouble concentrating and trouble with short-term memory would be particularly difficult for children who are trying to learn new things. It's also, by the way, difficult for adults who are trying to learn new things. So that brain fog can be particularly uh, difficult for, for everyone. And it, you know, it's going to take us a while. We don't know the optimal treatment for long COVID. Uh, so it's a particularly important that we try as hard as we can to protect all of our population um, so that we decrease the chances that uh, they will get long COVID. A couple more questions from Regina. Do I need another booster if I've had one in September? So, that, so Regina, I'm, I'm assuming that you're an adult. So uh, I'll take that one. So mm -hmm. for adults, if you received a, a, a booster in September, it was the bivalent booster. And if you're under 65, one dose is all you need unless you are immunocompromised. If you're immunocompromised, you should talk to your um, to your doctor and, and check or your nurse practitioner, whoever your healthcare provider is, and you should see whether you would benefit from an additional booster. Immunocompromised people and people 65 years of age and older are now eligible for additional boosters. For those 65 and older, it's a single additional booster. For those who are immunocompromised, they may get more than just one additional booster, but they that would be at the recommendation of uh, their healthcare provider. Uh, okay, uh, Kendra is asking, will there be a single shot in the fall with COVID and flu together? And Lisa asked the same thing. So what uh, are we? What are we? What are we looking for this fall? I haven't seen anything that they're going to be combining the two into a single shot. I would love for just to have one sore arm instead of two. So personally, I think that's a great idea. Um, but uh, I haven't seen anything official come through the pipeline. Um, I do know that the FDA will be meeting in June to decide and to discuss um, exactly what you're asking about, what's going to be available in the fall. So I think there's more information to come shortly um, regarding what to expect in the fall. Absolutely. And I would agree with you 100 percent. It's not going to be this year. Um, many of the pharmaceutical companies are working on a combined uh, COVID flu vaccine, uh, but it, it needs to be tested. It needs to be tested for safety. We need to ensure that it both works and that it's safe. So it, it was it's very unlikely that it would be um, available as early as this fall, maybe in the future. You know, there is something about two shots, then you have, you know, both arms hurt. So you have that, uh, you, you know, uh, whatever. The, the symmetry. symmetry. <laughs> what I was looking for. Thanks. You can uh, go for them at the same time, though. There's no contraindication to getting your COVID and flu vaccine at the same time if you desire, um, if you don't want to have to go to multiple appointments or 
Absolutely. Good, good, good uh, point. From Kitty, do you believe that the Novavax will ever be approved for children under 12? So I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, we know that the company is currently working on vaccines for other age groups, and they're also working on booster vaccines. But how long that will take and how quickly we will see it is uh, very difficult to predict. So, so keep your eye out for that. It is possible we will eventually have uh, another, you know, another option. But at the moment, you're exactly right. They don't have anything that's that's yet approved uh, for children under 12. And they also remember the Novavax as a booster is only recommended if you can't get the messenger RNA boosters. So it really is only only meant to um, it, it's. It's still the it's still just against the original strain. It's not yet a bivalent booster, but they are working on a bivalent booster as well. Yeah, I think if your child hasn't previously been vaccinated and they're over the age of 12, it is still recommended to get the bivalent vaccine unless, again, they have a specific contraindication to getting the bivalent mRNA vaccine, like they've had a previous allergic reaction to a, a dose of the monovalent vaccine or um you know, any, any other contraindication, or if, you know, you, you want, you prefer a more classic um, vaccine because it's more classic vaccine technology. It's, um, you know, a protein based vaccine. So, you know, if, if, if you weren't, if you weren't going to get them vaccinated with an MR, or mRNA vaccine, and you're more willing to get the Novavax, then that would be, you know, a reason to get the Novavax. Otherwise, in terms of efficacy, it's much more recommended to get the mRNA vaccine. Yeah. Um, so another question, uh, let's see, uh, from, from Deza, I thought we were, but, sorry, uh, from, from Bree, the school survey for air purifier, air purifiers, purifiers says it was due, um, April 12th. That date has passed and it seems that schools had only six days and may not have been aware. Can the date be extended? Yeah, so Brie, uh, we actually have already extended that date. Uh, we gave the schools originally about two weeks to opt into our program, um, but we have extended the date and we have communicated that to all schools uh, that the survey is still open. Um, and if there's any questions or concerns, they could always reach out to us at the department. So we, they've been provided with that information. So uh, great question, uh, but yes, the survey has been extended and we are still accepting schools for that HEPA program. Thanks. Uh, so from Deza, if I get my bivalent vaccine now, when do I need another one? Um, how old are you, Deza? <laughs> Let's say she's an adult. adult. Oh, yeah. So if you're an adult and you get your bivalent vaccine now, then, you know, unless you're immunocompromised, as we've mentioned previously, you are done and up to date, um, regardless of how many previous doses of, you know, the, the original COVID vaccine you had. Obviously, if you're immunocompromised and you need additional doses, then we recommend talking to your healthcare provider. And when a new vaccine comes out, then, you know, likely in the fall, there will be a new vaccine and it's, and it's certainly possible that you may need another uh, shot in the fall. But as of this moment, that would be, you know, it's, it's at the moment, it's one and done. So good, uh, good news. Uh, from Carolyn, can Paxlovid be prescribed to children? Um, so Paxlovid is um, technically not FDA approved. It is still under the emergency use authorization, and it has been approved in this, um, in this capacity for children 12 years and older who weigh more than 88 pounds who are at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19 disease. Um, so if your child is 12 or over and weighs 88 pounds or greater, then it is um, FDA, not fully FDA approved, but approved under the emergency use authorization. And again, I think the point that your child needs to be at risk for serious disease um, is, is an important one. So if, if, your if your child is otherwise healthy and not does not have a risk for severe illness, um, then yeah. Flaxlovid can be used at that age group, but it would not, that would not be the, the indication. Yeah, especially yeah, if your child has had vaccine. Yeah, if your child has had the vaccine, then they're, they're very 
unlikely to have a severe complication of COVID-19 and, and need Paxlovid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but always important to talk to your individual healthcare provider about whether your child would qualify or whether they would recommend it for your child if they meet the other criteria in terms of age and weight. Okay. Um, so, so here's a question. During the pandemic, we fell behind on some other childhood immunizations. Why is it important to catch up and what's the best way to do that? I think as Dr. Shaw was talking about earlier, um, you know, we've seen resurgence of, you know, vaccine preventable, preventable illnesses that we hadn't, you know, seen in high, as high of levels before. And, you know, we would expect to continue to see this more um, due to lapses in vaccines um, due to the pandemic. And so if, you, if you're concerned that your child has missed vaccines, it is really important to see, you know, their pediatrician and discuss their vaccine schedule with their primary care pediatrician to see if they, they do need to have any catch up vaccines, because it is really important that, that they're protected for all of the vaccine preventable illnesses, just in case, you know, we start to see them more in the community. Um, and, you know, the catch-up schedules really, again, depend on what they've received before um, and, and their age. And so we recommend talking to their pediatrician about it. And if I could add, Dr. Pine, um, there's also some other great resources in your community if you are lacking a medical home. So if your child, uh, you're struggling to find a medical provider, uh, the local health departments in your community, you could always reach out to them and they may be able to support your child with the immunization aspects and help you get linked up with a medical provider. Uh, we have federally qualified health centers um, in New Jersey that can support those that are not insured. And then also your school nurse, again, um, they are very vital in linking people who are be- perhaps behind on vaccines with these community providers that can assist you as you're working to get insurance or get linked up with a medical home. Um, So please, you know, reach out to your local health department or your school nurse if you are having difficulty finding a medical provider and they can certainly assist you in identifying one. Yeah, that's a very good point too. You know, there are federally qualified health centers that get vaccines through that VFC vaccine for children program. So all children qualify for vaccines, you know, regardless of insurance status or their ability to pay. Uh, there's a question from uh, Delaby about uh, lymphocytopenia that's found in long COVID. The Merck Diagnostic Manual is showing lymphocytopenia anywhere between 30 to 85 percent of all COVID cases. What is your response to that and uh, comment that the brain fog may be actually brain shrinkage? Um, so, so for I think we, you know, for long COVID. There certainly is more that we don't know about it than we do know about it. Um, the lymphocytopenia, I don't know if you have any comments about that. It, it certainly, it was recognized early in the pandemic that if your lymphocyte count was lower, that was a sign of more severe illness. Um, as far as what percentage of cases, I, I, I don't, I have not seen statistics about that um, in, in long COVID. Um, and it, you know, we're, we're, there are probably a multitude of mechanisms for long COVID, um, and we're still trying to learn about them. And I would, would uh, reinforce the things that uh, our pediatrician said about if your child is suffering from this, or if you're as an adult are suffering, uh, try to find one of the long COVID centers, because we really are trying to get more information about both uh, incident symptoms and management. So um, there is help out there uh, and try to find one of those centers uh, to really get you some help. I would just like to add, um, as physicians who take care of people that are hospitalized with viruses outside of COVID-19, it's a very well-established fact that viruses can suppress the body's ability to create the cells that they need to fight infection. Um, And so we see that with all types of viruses, not just COVID-19. And so... Um, it's not unusual to see the lymphocytopenia that you're describing or that you're asking about in the setting of 
all types of vac uh, all types of viruses and even after your body has recovered from the virus itself there's a period of time that your bone marrow is trying to rev itself back up again um, and so it's not a completely rare or unusual finding that after a serious viral illness you do have uh, a lymphocytopenia meaning that your bone marrow has not created the cells to a typical range that it needs to fight illness good points good points mm -hmm. Well, we're coming to the end of our hour here, and I'd like to give each of our panelists a chance to kind of leave you with a message. Uh, so, uh, Jamie, you want to start? What do you What do you want to leave our uh, audience with? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Fisher. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone for joining, and uh, thank you to all the wonderful pediatricians um, that I was able to be on this panel with. Uh, again, your local health department in your community is always going to be a resource for any public health concerns, questions, or things of, of that nature that you might have regarding COVID-19 or all of the other types of uh, infectious diseases that can be potentially transmitted. Um, there's also resources that they offer in the community, and they're just really our unsung heroes in public health that are out there doing great work, um, as well as our school nurses in our schools. Um, so again, just thank you uh, for joining. Um, again, our website, covid19.nj.gov, has a lot of material and will link to other areas of the Department of Health's website um, for you to review. And just thank you for joining. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Yeah, I'd like to just highlight the importance of, you know, having a medical home and having a pediatrician that you have a relationship with, um, particularly, you know, to ask these questions specifically regarding your child relating to, you know, standard vaccines and also related to the COVID vaccine um, and, you know, the, the specific needs of your child. So. Okay. And Dr. Shaw. Um, so thank you for inviting us to participate in this panel. It is certainly interesting times that we are all living in and navigating, um, you know, trying to figure out all this information and this information overload. So to having some trusted sources like through the Department of Health um, is really helpful. But just to echo what Dr. Pine said, having a medical home where you have someone who knows you, knows your family, knows your child, and can really provide you with the best evidence-based guidance on how to move forward with your child, um, not just with COVID-19, but with any other medical or health-related or preventative health-related issues is super important. Um, so again, thank you for taking the time to participate in this panel with us. Yeah, thank well, thank you. you. I want to really thank our panelists tonight. I think this has been a terrific uh, discussion. And I just agree wholeheartedly. You know, children are our future. We really want them to get the best care. And we know that they can get the best care when they're in a setting where they have con continuity of care. So whether it's, it's a pediatrician out in the community, whether it's a clinic, whether it's a fairly qualified health center, we really, it, if, you, if you can't find a doctor, Talk to your local health department. Talk to uh, talk to the people around you. Find those uh, find that place where your child can get the ongoing care that they need. And for information, remember covid19.nj.gov. That will give you information about COVID-19. And on our New Jersey Department of Health website, you can get a whole lot more information about all kinds of health problems. So thank you again. Thank you for joining us. And take care. Be safe.